Welcome to another special edition of Gareth Jones on Speed, recorded on location in the United States. This is the final episode visiting the Peterson Automotive Museum. And in this show, I explore the museum's display of American and international cars, legends of Los Angeles, and the exquisite Bruce Mayer collection. This is a video episode, and if you're accessing it on an iPhone, you should already see the images as the episode plays. However, Android users, if you're using Google Podcasts, you may need to switch to use a playback application such as VLC Player that allows you to see the images. Enjoy. Hello there, welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed. I'm Gareth, she's Summer. Say hello, Summer. Hello, Summer. <laughs> and once again, we're at the Peterson Automotive Museum on Wiltshire Boulevard That's correct. in Los Angeles. Are we actually in Hollywood or not? It's uh, no, it's, no, Los, it's Angeles. Los Angeles, California. And this is a museum I've visited before, not just downstairs a few minutes ago looking at the sci-fi exhibits but I remember being here and I think it must have been 94 when it had just been built 25 years ago that's madness that's insane I remember you know, it was in the pre-podcasting days how much I enjoyed it so I thought I'd share this visit with you as well I'm starting at a point that says start which is probably a smart thing to do smart thing yeah and let's see, what are they featuring? What are the headline cars at the Peterson Automotive Museum? I've got two extremes here. I'm going to go with this one to start, actually, because is there a more Hollywood car than this? Do you know the Hollywood connection of this car, Summer? Well, when I think of Porsche and Hollywood, I think of James Dean. Correct. Absolutely in one. It's a Porsche 550 Spider mid-engine racing car actually i think it was james dean who had a 356 speedster is this the car yet if zog was here zog would know let's see what it says the 550 spider whilst road legal was the first series production porsche designed specifically for racing and the first with a mid-mounted engine since the 356 number one so it is a successor to that car. The aluminium body and tube frame chassis reduced weight whilst the 110 horsepower, wow, wow so much power, <laughs> four cam flat four engine proved successful on the track. Porsche also utilised wind tunnel testing to improve airflow and the perfect shape of the Spider, which differed dramatically from the rear engine 356. Okay, so this isn't Jimmy Dean's car. Not James Dean's no. car. But it raced at Le Mans in the 1953 24 hour of Le Mans. Do you see the price when new? $6,800 price now, $65,222. Should have wow. bought one of those all that those was years an investment. ago. Mm. And there's another Porsche, a less glamorous Porsche parked right next to it. This is either a 914 or a 917. Porsche VW, yeah, 914-6 this one, which is the bigger engine, I think. Never the most reliable of Porsches, the most 70s of all Porsches, in my opinion. You wouldn't think that was a Porsche with all those straight edges, you know, no compound curves. Looks like a Miata. <laughs> the Mazda MX-5, we would call it. It does, yeah, it's, it's a similar sort of sports car, really, except this is mid-engine. The Miata had the engine in the nose, didn't it? great i actually, i love the 914 i think it was a cool oddball porsche and you know me i like the oddball cars right yeah this is almost state-of-the-art for porsche at the moment it's almost not quite a few years ago the 2015 porsche 918 spider a successor to the carrera gt v8 petrol electric hybrid incredible piece of engineering the first car it says here ever to run a lap at the Nürburgring under seven minutes that's been smashed now by an electric car yeah but it's not lovely do you it like a Porsche lovely. you see a lot of Porsches around here don't I you? prefer the Boxster to tell you the truth that's yeah. the favorite of mine yeah I had a Boxster on loan from Porsche for a little while a couple of years ago and it was a revelation I had no idea they were that good <laughs> <laughs> I knew they were good I didn't know they were that good 
Right, let's have a look. What else? Oh, there's a 914 racing Porsche here as well in bright orange. Don't know what that's all about. No information about it, but it's a proper sports car, that is. Ooh, hello. Right, right, I should be able to get this. I reckon this is a Bertoni, this car at the front. I'm approaching it. Is it a Maserati concept by Bertoni? I could be wrong. We're in the Chuck Wengler Gallery. Japanese supercars. What's this then? That's got to be a Bertoni, all those straight edges. The only script on it is in Japanese. Let's have a look. Is there a clue here as to what this is? Hmm, bear with me. It's an exhibition of Japanese supercars. Okay, someone's found the information. What is it? It is a 1978 Dome Zero. Oh, yes. Now, the Dome... Dome raced out Le Mans with, I think, a version of the Dome Zero. It's a sort of a geometric version of the Lancia Stratos in many ways. Beautiful. Edgy. Who designed it for them, then? Automotive tuner and racing aficionado Minoru Hayashi founded the company, but who designed the car? It doesn't say. That's got to be influenced by Bertoni, all the straight edges. So there's no Bertoni badge on there. So it's just the Japanese learning how to do European design of the period. Oh, woof. And parked next to it is, uh, what do we call this? The Is it the LSF, the Lexus LSF, which was a V10 engine hybrid ultra supercar. LFA, not the LSF, the LFA. And in many ways, the mother to that car that I was driving, the LC500. Quite a car, V10 engine, if I think I remember, if memory serves. Vicious, powerful. Nice to see it looking clinical here. So this whole area is dedicated to Japanese supercars. Is this an R30? There's a Nissan Le Mans racer here. What do we call this? R350 GT1. <laughs> From 1998. After a four-year absence, Nissan Motorsports, Nismo, returned to the 24 Hours of Le Mans in 95. Based on previous Group C race cars, its R390 GT1 debuted in 97 and also competed in 98. Its best finish was an impressive third overall and represented the highest rank for the Japanese driver at the time. This R390 GTI is a one-off road-going version created to meet the homologation requirements of its class at Le Mans. I think this was actually based on a TWR chassis that started out life as a Jaguar. Uh, this car's had quite a journey. I think that's right in saying that. I think the 390 GT1 was a Tom Walkinshaw car built in... Uh, what was the name of Tom Walkinshaw's base in Britain? Can't think right now. Can't think. This looks like a race car. Yeah, it, it really looks like is. like a Hot Wheel. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, this car would not only race at Le Mans, but very nearly won it. It is a proper Le Mans 24-hour sports car, homologated for road use to meet the requirements so that they could run it at Le Mans or in other racing like IMSA over here. How wonderful. Mm. And what's a Japanese... What's a, sorry, what's an Italian SUV doing in an exhibition of Japanese supercars? <laughs> it's completing the picture. OK, that's what it says on the wall. Upon completion of assembly, the Levante is subjected to numerous quality control tests. So, it's, it's a Maserati Levante S. Looks very handsome. I wonder if it's sponsored. Each area of this museum is sponsored by different manufacturers. When we walked in, it did say Italy, but yeah. then down the center, it was the Japanese. So these are cars of the world on this floor. That's we'll get right. to Americana elsewhere. Help if I read all this before I walked in. <laughs> now, my pal Johnny Smith would faint if he saw this car. He Why likes is that? Johnny drives. A Chevrolet, what's it called, Volt. He's got a very early hybrid, but this was the first EV. This is the 1996 General Motors EV1. Probably the first electric car on sale in large volumes in the world. And if memory serves, 
you couldn't buy this car. You sort of half bought it, half leased it from General Motors. They were experimenting with electrical power for cars, pure electric car. And then, for some reason, General Motors took them back from the people that they leased them to and buried them in the desert somewhere. That's the story. Don't know what that's all about. I may have misremembered that story. But Sounds like something for future alien usage. Yes, they arrive on Earth. They bury their cars in the desert. We understand they worship cars. They bury them like they're dead. I wonder. Here we go. The EV1 was the first modern mass-produced electric vehicle built by a major manufacturer. It was ultra-aerodynamic, lightweight, had an acceptable commuting range, about 80 miles or something, I think. What's it say? 100 miles. Yeah, that's pretty good. And could easily be driven by the average motorist. Consumers could only lease, not buy the cars, from select dealers in California, Arizona and Georgia. After four years of costly production, the EV1 was discontinued and all but 40 were dismantled dismantled and buried in the desert so this is a very very rare car and a pioneer it was ahead of its time sometimes if you're proposing something really science fiction you're the first to market you pay to develop all the ideas for everybody else this car would have cost billions to develop and they didn't sell any they leased a few but paved the way for the evs of today yeah here's another battery electric car i've never seen this before 1994 U.S. electric car GTP Coupe. Derived from the gas-powered Consulet GTP supercar, the U.S. electric car GTP was touted when new as the only series-produced composite-bodied electric coupe on the market. Fair play. It was built by the same California firm that also converted otherwise standard cars to all electric vehicles for fleet use to meet California emissions standards back in 94. See, you're five years ahead of us at least over here somewhere. (laughs) Neiman Marcus, which is, you know, one of our very high standard department stores, offered it in their Christmas catalog. Wow, that's neat. Honey, I've marked all the things I'd like for Christmas and dog-eared the pages. (laughs) (laughs) I'd like a $75,000 electric car. And there's a picture of Leslie Nielsen, the star of Airplane and Police Squad movies and so many others, who I met once and shook hands with and made me laugh. And I believe he's of Welsh extraction. His family in Welsh, if I remember. I think his mother was born in Wales. But a picture of him sitting in the car in an advertisement promoting the GTP Sport Coupe, whose manufacturer was known as Solar Electric Engineering, before renamed US Electric Car in 1994 at the Neiman Marcus catalogue. Amazing. That is amazing. It's a funny looking thing, it really is. It's cute, it's on its age, it's just not quite right, is it? No. Not quite right. More like a matchbox than a Hot Wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, they've got the running gear of the Tesla Model S here, what they call the skateboard platform, the way that electric cars has revolutionized our approach to building cars. We now build these sort of skateboard platforms where the battery pack sits as low as possible to keep the center of gravity low in between the front and rear wheels. What this done is given cars a much longer wheelbase. The wheels are right at the back of the car now. The electric motor sits in between the rear wheels and if you've got the dual motor version, you've got one at the front in the frunk. Is that what you call the front trunk? The frunk. I've never heard that expression before. (laughs) But I'm looking at this and thinking boot to bonnet, that's over double my Mini. Of course it is, yeah. It's a big car, the Model S, yeah. And your Mini truly is a a Mini car for America. No, it's not. For over here it is, (laughs) but in Britain it's a monster car. Right, what else have we got? We've got some other innovative vehicles. Oh, hang on. Is this the um, French electric car that I spotted in... um, No, it isn't. It's a Canadian car, a Galt, a 1914 Galt. A Canadian Galt gasoline engine ran a generator that supplied electricity to an electric motor that propelled the car. This is the first series hybrid, or, well, one of the first series hybrids. This car is one of only two ever built and appeared 13 years after Ferdinand Porsche developed the world's first gas electric hybrid, the Semper Vivus. Oh, there you go, I didn't know about that. But look at this. This is hybrid technology from the turn of the century. Yeah, there's the petrol engine in front of a generator, an electric generator. 
very long bonnet. It's almost steampunk, isn't it? It is steampunk. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. A gas electric hybrid, petrol electric hybrid. Yeah, the indicators on the side of the car, someone's pointing out. It's got indicators. Are they on both sides? You call them turn blinkers, don't you? What do you call them over here, turn indicators? You... Well, most people don't even use them in California, <laughs> to be honest, but I call it the indicator. People call it the turn signals. Turn signals over here. And on one side of the car, it's got left and right. So it's got a red lamp above a blue lamp and the left one has got an arrow pointing left and it says left and the one below says right it's spelled r-i-t-e <laughs> and what else is strange is that you've got it on the left side of the car which in america you know we drive on that side however this car has the steering column on the right side it's a right hand drive car so wouldn't the driver need to see it on to, that yeah. side as well? Have we actually got... We can't see around the back of the car to yeah. see if it's got the indicators on both sides. I rather suspect it hasn't. Why is it right-hand drive, though? It must be based on either an Italian car from that period, because the Italians were right-hand drive until about 1930-something, I think, or even a British car. But who knows? There's a history of hybrid cars here, but it doesn't tell us about this right-hand drive. It's Canadian. Were they right-hand drive like we are in Britain once upon a time? Who knows? It's a mystery. It's we'll a mystery. Find out on another podcast. Yes, we will. <laughs> Correct. There's a lovely 1915 Detroit electric car, again from the Dawn and Motoring. This is beautiful. This is a classic three-box design. You know, the first box is where the engine goes, and the cabin, which could be from a horse-drawn carriage, couldn't it? That's exactly what it looks like. Yeah. It looks like the horses just haven't turned up today. And the third box, which is the trunk, as you say over here, Detroit Electric, great name for a company. I've never seen that before. And a Honda FX, a fuel cell car. Now... So, Matt, I've told them on this program before. I'm going to be really boring now because I'm going to repeat myself. But the fuel cell, the device which allows you to react hydrogen with oxygen to create electricity, creating mm -hmm. water as the side product of it, is actually a Welsh invention. It was the Welsh who invented the fuel cell. It never really caught on until the Apollo space program. But they used it to create electricity for the command and service module on the way to the moon. So that was the Welsh contribution to getting us on the moon. It's amazing that it's not just car, it's also space, it's also Welsh. Do you see that <laughs> relating factor? <laughs> That's my Venn diagram all in one, isn't it? Space, Wales and cars all in one. You know me well. Summer's been a friend since 1984. She does rather know me well. And there's a solar wind hybrid here from 87 Mana LA 85 mile per hour Mana La not Mana LA Mana La means power of the sun in Hawaiian how's your Hawaiian summer? oh I can say Mele Kalikimaka but that's about it and is that ordering coffee? oh that's happy Christmas <laughs> that's very handy so this car is called Mana La meaning power of the sun in Hawaiian is driven in part by electricity that's generated when light strikes the photovoltaic cells covering the vehicle's surface yeah it's one big solar panel wrapped round a tubular canoe like glass fibre lightweight chassis it's a trike one wheel at the front two wheels at the back probably set a record which took part in the world solar challenge a 1980 mile race from darwin to adelaide in australia oh yeah that big one paving the way solar powered cars haven't really caught on we haven't managed to harness enough power from solar energy for a practical car yet and then there's a chart on the wall explaining alternative fuels everything from wood chips to create biomass and ethanol coal even Electricity from nuclear or solar, gasoline, as they say over here, petrochemical, kerosene, diesel, liquefied petroleum gas, liquefied natural gas, compressed natural gas, methanol, biodiesel, which is made from vegetable oils or fat, and then the hydrogen range, hydrogen fuel cell and hydrogen internal combustion. And wood chips, of course, where they made... Um, what was the gas called from wood chips? There was a name from it. I can't quite remember what it was called. Well, that's a whole range of fuels that we use. 
which you lot over here in California are very sensitive to you know emission regulations over here have been far ahead of British emission regulations for many many years for quite a while now that's yeah. great so we've come through into another gallery now full of Americana Oh, a nice low rider from 2011, a real beautiful shiny custom car. Actually, I prefer this if I'm honest. A 1964 Chevy Impala low rider. Well, that's what you expect to see when you think about a low rider car. Yeah, that is a 70s lime green and blue, low, flat, glitzy piece of art really isn't it it used to be a car it's actually a piece of art everything about it yeah look at that fender everything every detail all the bars are right across the grill across the the headlamps i like the 50s stuff but the 60s and 70s stuff speaks to me before that though we've got some low riders here some real custom cars gosh you are the home of all that here aren't you really they still have some of the driving going on uh, in uptown Whittier it's known for it has been for decades they, they have cruises up there do they yes this is a 1948 Cadillac Sidonette the Cadzilla by Hot Rods by <laughs> Boyd Cadzilla I like that a 500 cubic inch V8 sitting oh it's purple it's, I call that Cadbury's purple that colour, deep, deep, deep purple. It's almost black. And, uh, Gorgeous. Yeah. Commissioned by Billy Gibbons. From ZZ Top. From ZZ Top. One of my relations, Gas Top's cousin, ZZ Top. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another 1950s low rider here as well. What's this? It's a Mercury Hero Harter by Barris Custom. Okay, so that's Mr. Barris who designed the Batmobile again. And he's taken a lovely 1951 Mercury and lowered it. I mean, it's terrifying. It's like Christine, isn't it? The killer car. Oh, yeah. Had a bit of that about it, didn't it, that period? And behind me... Mm, it's just got to be a stingray, isn't it? That color. Yeah. What would you describe that color? Tangerine you orange. In fact, nearly matches my purse. It really is. I'd say your purse was uh, Clementine. <laughs> I think we've just found the name for my purse. <laughs> it is that glorious sort of sun glow, 70s, 60s orange. It's got to be a Corvette under here, but it's got two separate cabins, a closed cabin for the driver, left-hand drive, and the passenger has got an open cabin. Oh, it's a Ford. No. Really? It's got a Ford badge on it. I thought that was a Corvette. It's not. It's a 1946 Ford V8. Customising legend Gene Winfield constructed Starstrip, which is the name of this car, for Bob Larry V's Promotions Incorporated Show Circuit, a travelling exhibition that gave custom car makers an opportunity to show their vehicles to a wide audience, gain awards and publicity for their work, and for many, attract clients. Master craftsman Gene Winfield hand-built the one-of-a-kind asymmetric body which he designed in collaboration with Ernie Graves and mounted on a 1946 Ford chassis. That's sexy, isn't it? It really is. And I'm not sure, but I can almost see the driver, which looks like it would need to be about the size of a jockey. Yeah, 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 to get in. With maybe a 1956 pinup girl. Yeah, in the passenger seat. In the passenger seat. Dead right. Cheesecake. Oh, yeah? definitely. Absolutely. And it's got a kind of a gullwing door. Well, it's got a two-part door. The door lowers like a tailgate on a station wagon, you might say. The steering wheel, it's not a steering wheel per se. It's two levers on chrome plates with holes drilled in them. A classic sort of 60s look. Fierce. I love it. All right, let's go see some more. Should we head that way? Sure. Garrett Jones Right, 
We're into the Bruce Mayer Family Gallery now. Winning numbers, it says, on the board on the wall. The first, the fastest, the famous. The Bruce Mayer Collection. One of the world's foremost ambassadors of automotive enthusiasm, California-based car aficionado Bruce Mayer, has spent decades carefully building a collection of truly superlative vehicles. Preferring the title of enthusiast of a collector... Bruce only acquires cars of substantial importance and emotional impact, often without regard for investment potential. Okay. Lucky him. Mm, nice to be in that position. As a result, his stable of classics, hot rods and race cars, while not immense in scale, is amongst the most significant anywhere. Really? Winning Numbers presents a selection of Bruce's finest competition vehicles, each with a story as captivating as its beauty. These machines are regularly driven and appear in this exhibition as a testament to Bruce's passion and ongoing desire to share with others. OK, very florid description of what we have. We're in a room with how many cars? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I think. We'll start with some Americana. There's a thing here called a dream come true. The 1929 Ford altered roadster. In 2012, Bruce Mayer set out to fulfill a long-held dream on the historic Bonneville Salt Flats to drive over 200 miles per hour in an open vehicle. To reach such a high speed, Bonneville legend Mike Cook completely rebuilt the racer and tuned the engine to produce a monstrous 1,000 horsepower. As Mayer streaked down the salt flats during his final opportunity to reach his goal, he followed his never lift motto, kept his foot hard on the pedal, and ended up clocking a blistering 204 miles per hour in this custom built roadster. Imagine doing 200 mile per hour in that. It's a proper roadster, isn't it? It's beautiful. Looks like a fire engine. It is fire engine red. The and numbering. Has, yeah, everything. all the design. Yeah, 747 on the side. I wonder what the significance of that number is for him then. But it is a testament to lightweight, efficient design from a 1929 chassis. Incredible. Now, Zog would like this. This is a Porsche 935. Is this the one that actually won Le Mans in 79? So let's have a look. Don and Bill Whittington, the brothers, and Klaus Ludwig. I've got a model of this car in my collection. Oh, perfect. Yeah. It's a 1979 Porsche 935 Crema K3, the holy grail of 911s. The 935K3, it says here, was a racing variant of the 911 Turbo designed for the highly competitive FAA Group 5 production-based class. Battling against pure prototypes of factory team racers, this Crema prepared 935 captured a spectacular and surprising win when it was driven to overall victory in 79 at the 24 hours of Le Mans. It became the only 911-based Porsche to win overall at Le Mans and is one of just two production-based cars to win overall in post-war years. And do you know what the other one is? It's the McLaren F1. Very rare car. This is the actual car in Bruce Meyer's collection. I'm going to have my photo taken with this baby. So good like this. There. Picture grabbed. Okay, let's keep going round. There's a dragster here. A short, not a rail. They call the very, very long dragsters, top field dragsters, rails. This is a short chassis one. It's a 62 Greer Black Prudhomme. A Greer Black Prudhomme top field dragster. State of the art for its day, the Greer Black Prudhomme from 1962 was one of the most beautiful ever built and also the most successful. Tuned by Keith Black and driven by Don the Snake Prudhomme. <laughs> the Snake. It immediately dominated the drag racing circuit and consistently ran the quarter mile in under eight seconds at speeds in excess of 190 miles per hour. With an unparalleled record of 237 wins and only four losses, the top fuel racer was acquired by Bruce Mayer as the ultimate example of a pioneering era dragster. I wouldn't disagree with that at all. That's a fast car. Now, the next car, I think they call this thing a tank. They run on the salt beds, 
and it was made from the fuel tank of uh, an aircraft if I remember it converted there we go the most famous belly tank the 52 SoCal Speed Shop Special Belly Tank Racer American ingenuity at its best the idea of converting a surplus fuel tank from a P-38 Lightning Fighter into a race car was originated by returning World War II servicemen this SoCal Southern California special created by the founder of the original SoCal speed shop Alex Zydas is that how you say his name? or Zydias uh, Zydias okay yes Oh, telephone call from Miss Etta. It's the most famous of the belly tanks built. It began toppling records as soon as it hit the salt flats and dry lakes. But its most memorable performance came in 52 at Bonneville when the car shattered five class records using three different Ford flathead engines. Oh, really? They changed the engine. Nice soundtrack, by the way. I like this. That's a pure aerodynamic design. It's like a pointy bullet, isn't it? It's like beautiful. A, like a porpoise. Now, there's a Corvette here, but why is this Corvette here? This is a very famous one. It was the first Corvette to race at Le Mans. Thank you for bringing Corvette to Le Mans, because they race even today at Le Mans Corvette, and they bring a soundtrack to that race that no other car provides. But they don't look like this. They don't look like this at Le Mans these no. days, no. They look like modern race cars, and the next one is going to be a mid-engine car. This is a white car in American race colours, white with two blue stripes, a 1960 Chevrolet Corvette. Briggs Cunningham returned to Le Mans. He'd been there before with his own cars, but then turned up in 60 with three fuel-injected Corvettes. Fuel injection in 1960. And the goal of outright victory. Though there was no official support by the factory because of the manufacturer's racing ban, Chevrolet engineer Zora Akos Dutov covertly provided assistance to the American team in order to prepare the cars for the historic event. The team finished a remarkable first in class and eighth overall. Quite an achievement in that race. The hardest, greatest race in the world. Exciting. Is this a Ferrari? What's this? It is a Ferrari. Oh, another Le Mans race, another IMSA racer. This is, as, as Americans put it, we don't say this in British English, but it is the winningest Ferrari ever. The Ferrari that's won most, really? A 1957 Ferrari Testarossa, 65-250. One of the most successful privately campaigned Ferraris ever raced. This Testarossa is one of only two ever built by the factory with a Tipo 625 Grand Prix racing engine. John von Neumann and Richie Ginther pilot the Ferrari to an incredible 11 wins during the 1957 season. And Ken Miles later drove it to victory at Santa Barbara in 62, not that far from here. When Bruce Mayer tracked down this rare Ferrari in Europe, he repatriated it to the US and reunited it with its 250 Testarossa V12 engine during restoration. 170 mile per hour, 285 horsepower, 3 litre Columbo V12 that's a racing Ferrari. Again, I know what you're going to say. You're going to look at it and go, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. It is, isn't it? And the classic you know, pinstriping on the leather seats. Yeah. It's yeah. just the beautiful. Yeah. Oh, the piping. chrome gearbox, the wood steering wheel. You'd want to get in that and just drive away now down Wiltshire Boulevard, wouldn't you? Uh, It'd look like a trillion dollars. Huh? PCH. PCH? PCH car. What's PCH? Pacific Coast Highway. Oh, of course it is. Yes, yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah, you'd want to go down that big road on that, wouldn't you? There's a Cobra here. Now, why is this Cobra here? This AC Cobra, a British car with an American engine. That suit both you and me, Summer, wouldn't it? This is the first production Shelby Cobra oh, from 1962. Amazing. This is it, the actual first. Wow. Wow. They weren't kidding, all that blurb about this collection. They actually weren't kidding. When Carroll Shelby dropped an American V8 engine into a lightweight British roadster, he created one of the most important American sports cars in motorsport history. This Cobra, chassis, hash, CSX 2001, is the first production car built and the first to enter competition. 
It's black. It's got a number one on the side. It resulted in continual modifications and upgrades to keep up with Shelby factory team cars. After a successful racing career in Europe, it was acquired by Bruce Mayer, who maintains the car in running condition and frequently drives it to shows and on rallies. I love Bruce Mayer. I know. I just want to thank him. Yes. He's compiled all these cars into a remarkable collection. Okay, there's two more cars we should mention here, perhaps three. The world's fastest coupe, a 1934 Ford Pearson Brothers Coupe. Uh, Pearson Brothers Coupe drew the attention of the hot rodding world as soon as it began competing. It stood out amongst the field of hot rods, not only for its professionally painted livery, but because it was a coupe beating the roadsters. After a year of record-setting runs by this car, the SCTA finally opened a class for coupes and sedans. An innovative first, the car's distinct profile was created by chopping the top and laying back the windshield to meet the windshield's height requirement regulation and minimise wind resistance. It's a chop top, the slimmest of chop tops. That side window, it's like looking through a pair of snow glasses. It's only a couple of inches tall. Plexiglass, lightweight. How do you get in? Well, they're called suicide doors. These are reverse doors, so they hinge at the rear of the door. You open it and you have to duck down to squeeze in, then someone else has to close the door for you. You couldn't possibly do it yourself. Amazing. Oh, there's another Ferrari here. Let me get the spec of this one right. This might be one of the most important Ferraris you would ever hope to see. It's a 250 GT SWB SEFAC from 1961. Intent on winning the Constructors' Championship for the GT class, Ferrari hot-rodded five 250 GT short wheelbase SWBs. They did this specifically for the 61 24 hour Le Mans. This chassis 2689 is one of those factory built racers. Equipped with an ultra lightweight chassis, light gauge alloy body, higher output engine. After handing the manufacturer a significant class win at Le Mans, this SWB continued to dominate the track, earning enough winning points to help bring the coveted championship home to Ferrari. First in class, 1961, 24 hours of Le Mans. Gods. These cars are gods. There's no other way about it. And there's a Le Mans Ferrari, I think we have to mention, as the last car in this room. It sits resplendent in the middle of the room. It's red. It's not a Ferrari, it's an Itzo Bizzarini A3 slash C Competition, the competition if you speak in English. The A3 slash C finished an astounding first in class and top 10 overall in the 65 24 hour Le Mans. Competing in the prototype class against factory backed purpose built race cars such as the Ford and the Ferrari, it was an unexpected triumph for the small automaker and the cars builder Giotto Bizzarini. While the A36-C was retired at the end of 65 racing season, it continued to be driven by subsequent owners, including Bruce Mayer, we love Bruce Mayer, who believes cars are meant to be driven and takes it to local shows. I bet everyone did the same thing as me, thought it was an obscure Ferrari when you see it. It looks like that, definitely. Yeah. Bizzarini. Iso, now did Iso, who designed the... Um, a friend of mine, Rob, has got a collection of Isso road cars. Is it the Griffo he's got? And what was the other one? The Quattroporte. This is, says Griffo on the front. Pizzarini, Griffo, Livorno. Yeah, Livorno. I don't know. But an exercise in motor racing engineering of the 1960s, you know? Rivets, roundels, sense it being lightweight. I want to kiss it. They go right ahead. <laughs> I think I'd get thrown out if I did. Some cars I want to kiss. Now, we may have seen all the cars. There is a collection of motorbikes here. But I'm wondering... There is another floor. Legends of Los Angeles. Oh, my Lord. How long is this programme going to be? <laughs> we'll bypass the bike, because I'm no expert in bikes, I'm ashamed to say. 
but let's go and have a look at the legends of Los Angeles for the final part of this program because we're in Los Angeles let's talk local let's see Southern California race cars and their builders. Southern California may not be rich in the natural resources traditionally needed to support industrial growth, but its lack of coal, iron, timber and fresh water is more than compensated for by the collective ambition, creativity and resourcefulness of its population. And I'm talking about you, Nessa. Oh, thank you. Adapting their progressive spirit to rethink the very nature of the automobiles that define Southern California, local innovators developed especially ingenious competition machines. Whether built from scratch or derived from existing automobiles, such vehicles did not require abundant raw materials or a vast manufacturing infrastructure. All that was needed was a drafting paper, common shop tools and a ready supply of tinkerers with time talent and creativity well let's go and see <laughs> oh man okay it's a display i'll paint the picture for you in the middle of the room there's a rail a top fuel drag so you know with that extended chassis tiny wire pram wheels on the front big fat slicks on the rear and a Ford 427 cubic inch V8, probably supercharged and nitrous charged as well, sitting just ahead of the driver. When these things blow, you don't want to be sitting behind them, do you? Oh, no. It's a 1967 Shelby Super Snake, piloted by Don the Snake Prudholm again. Remember him? I mean, the archetypal dragster. And all chrome. You always add glitz, you Californians. You can't stop yourself, can we you? We can't stop ourselves. The sun's shining off of it. It's just blindingly beautiful. Yeah. And around this car is a display of a variety of... Uh, I'm going to go from the smallest car around there. I think the oldest car. And then come round. What do they call these? Juniors? What do they call these little racers? Forgive me for not knowing. There's a 1947 Curtis Craft leader card. A little mini race car that raced in... Uh, is it the Midget series? I think that's what they possibly called Midget, it. Midget, yes. yeah, I'm no expert. Cute, chrome, polished. Next to it, a 1924 Miller. And you can see the lineage of how we went from these upright cars of the 1920s and the 30s to more rounded more solid lighter faster quicker things you can see the progression there's another tank car here a 1948 king and hansen tank car is this another p38 fighter fuel tank that's been reworked into a car for maximum aerodynamics to run on salt flats it is from a p38 e amazing a watson debbie shop how special how oh. how oh. <laughs> from 1956 aj watson built a brand new chassis and with the help of racing mechanic bob de bishop constructed the how special for dirt champ racing car's name derived from the last names of the owners marty holman judge george ober and roger walcott h-o-w how all hailed from indiana but turned to the Southern Californian-based Watson to prepare their new race car. Powered by a 252 cubic inch Offenhauser, the Howe Special competed in over 58 races from 56 to 61, winning a championship and achieving 10 top 10 finishes. A midget racer. I think you're probably very close to the sort of things that ran at Indianapolis. Or even if they did run at Indianapolis. Or forgive me if I don't know this. Yes. Watson built cars, won the Indianapolis 500 six times between 56 and 64. Watson himself won 29 national championship races as crew chief. You probably heard my phone bleeping then. I've got messages coming in, which means it's time to wrap up this show. More dragsters, more hot rods. America in all its glory. And I'm pleased to see another Cobra, a British car with an American engine, uniting the two continents thanks to Carol Shelby who put that whopping great engine in that lovely lightweight British chassis there's an Eagle an all American single seater race car from 1966 here that raced Dan Gurney I think was the father of Eagle wasn't he they raced in Indy right up till oh, the 90s at some point let's see 
All-American Racers was formed in Santa Ana, California in 65 by legendary driver and race car manufacturer and team owner Dan Gurney, there you go, in collaboration with Carol Shelby. Called Eagles because of their distinctive frontal appearance, that sort of beak that they have over the air intake. The cars embodied the many innovations that resulted because of Gurney's experience as a race car driver, which he translated into innovative race car engineering. Over the 10 in racing, Gurney and his AAR team, or All American Racers, have pioneered significant technological advancements and achieved numerous racing milestones. The Gurney flap was something that he came up with, a way of improving aerodynamic performance from a wing, high wings, and lots of other innovations too. Unbelievable, a glorious collection. There's a one of the early sort of NASCAR stock car from 1964, a Mercury Marauder from the golden age of saloon car racing in America. It's lovely to see it in context here. I mean, it's such a huge thing, Summer. Isn't I would it? take that one home any day. Yeah, is that what you'd like? Oh, I love it. Love of it. all of these, is that's the one you want? The 64 Mercury. Crazy about a Mercury. And then there's a Baja buggy. 1970 Ford Bronco, Big Ollie, designed by Vels Parnelli Jones Racing. Parnelli Jones, relation of mine. <laughs> Big Ollie was one of the first purpose built off road race cars to compete at Baja. Built from scratch, it featured a chrome molly tube frame, a one off chassis, it was, and Bronco style fiberglass body. The legendary off roading team of Bill Strop and Parnelli Jones raced Big Ollie from 1970 to 74 and accumulated numerous victories, including back-to-back wins at Baja 1071 and 72. Handsome, isn't it? Functional, and it says California all over it. It, it does. races in the desert. What fun that was. I'm sure there are other parts of this museum I have to visit. There's other floors, but for now... I'm going to stop it here. I hope you've enjoyed our visit to the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, California. You've been listening to Summer. Say bye-bye, Summer. Bye-bye, Summer. And it's goodbye from me, Gareth. Uh, Next time we speak, maybe I'll be back in the UK. See ya. To send us an email, see pictures, get song lyrics, join our Facebook fan site, follow us on Twitter, or to find out about sponsorship opportunities, go to garethjones.tv. Gareth Jones on Speed is made in London by Whizbang. Gareth Jones on Speed! <laughs>